you have three or four ATMs in the dispensary, you're making $4,000 a month net from those machines. Who uses ATMs anymore if they take credit? Why would you even use an ATM? I do not think that cash is going to go away for the next 20 years. I have a tire store that's two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars a month in sales. All we do is we go talk to the owner, we put it in a machine. I'm going to make two, three hundred dollars a month on that account. I was able to scale from those six ATMs to thirty ATMs within eighteen months. Mm. The reason why I was able to do that. What's going on, wealth builders? Today I've got two interesting guests. We're going to be talking about the ATM business and the merchant services business. Now I'll tell you, for me. I've seen the ATM stuff for many, many years. Um, I've even had people like Investment Joy on who owns multiple ATMs and he makes all these viral TikToks, kind of him collecting cash. And I've actually heard people talk about merchant services being a huge industry, obviously with companies like Stripe and PayPal and all these things. And um, I've always wondered how profitable they really were. And these guys are going to finally give us the scoop. I got none other than John, who's been in the merchant service business for how many years? Uh, 18 years. 18 years. And then I've got Paul, who's new to the business mm -hmm. and, you know, was in law enforcement. We're going to get into that, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, Paul, why don't you start off, man? I mean, how does a cop get into this business? Oh, man. I, uh, well, before I was a cop, I was in corporate America for about six years, was in law enforcement. And you might be familiar with this small town, Oakland. Yep. I know you played a, a little ball yep. down there, man. Yep. And uh, yeah, seven years in police work. Being a Maybe. cop in Oakland's got to be pretty rough. It was very unique. <laughs> <laughs> it was controlled chaos, man. And I came in there as an introvert. So it really made me flourish as an extrovert and then also as a leader. Um, and it's because I've never been militant. So when I went to academy, you know, they were yelling at you and they were trying to break you down to build you back up. And I'm like, all right, man, I'll do whatever you want, but just don't yell at me. Right. So, so essentially, um, as I went through that transition, really found who I was as a person at that time, I was in my mid twenties, man. I was about like 26. Um, <sighs> never thought I was going to be a cop, to be right. honest with you. I didn't have any direction in life. Come from immigrant uh, parents, mom from Peru, dad from Mexico, originally from San Francisco. Um, and wasn't studious, dropped out of college, man, to go work in corporate America at the age of 21. Right. But I was always a hard worker. So I go into law enforcement, went to a couple critical incidents, man, that changed my life. Uh, primarily, I worked as a detective for a narcotics task force where we were target cartel members, mainly going into the county uh, over there in the Bay Area. And uh, there was an incident where I had my entire team, we did a raid in a hotel room with a drug dealer that we had arrested before. And as soon as we made entry to the actual hotel room, the guy was actually sniffing uh, opiate. It was a uh, fentanyl. Wow. And uh, as we got into the room, we breached the room. The guy gets up and all this powder fentanyl is just in the air, man. Well, it hits us, right? We're, we're like, whoa. The first guy through the door, which was a really good friend of mine, within seconds, turns blue, hands blue, looked like he died on the floor. At that time, I had just got shipped out to Quantico in Virginia to go uh, get trained at the DEA Academy for fentanyl to actually get trained up on Narcan, which is an antidote that actually fights that opiate. So luckily at that time, that was the first operation we just did after I came back. And I was like, immediately get the Narcan. I mean, this is what I was trained for. We were able to get him up after like three, four dosages. And from there, got him shipped out to the hospital, saved his life. But that was, a, you could say, a scenario that changed my life, man. Because at the end of the day, I got into law enforcement because I actually wanted to help people. I actually wanted an adventure. You know, I wanted to do something completely different for the community. And for a town like Oakland, man, I mean, Oakland's a beautiful city. But at the end of the day, it's controlled chaos down there. Yeah. And uh, very crime ridden. It's gotten washed through the years. And uh, what I can say is that the last two years, that's when I started looking into businesses. Um, my entire life, I've always been a serial entrepreneur. I was a nightclub promoter from 18 to 22, man. Mm. Um, How does a nightclub promoter become a cop? I don't know. Exactly, right? Yeah. Um, which, which is funny. But like I said, I never thought I would be a cop, man. Uh, growing up, I was yeah. afraid of cops. Right. Um, my mom, that was actually her dream. I mean, okay. she's from Peru. 
uh, she's in her late fifties and she was just like, I always wanted to be a detective back in Peru, but they wouldn't allow her because women couldn't be law enforcement officers in that country. So when I got picked up to be a cop, she was just like, I'm, you're literally living, I'm living through you, you know, what, what I wanted to do in life. So she was very proud. It was a very proud moment, but to be honest, it's because my ex, mm. <laughs> my ex is seven years. Um, her cousin, was a prior sergeant uh, of police for SFPD at that time. And he was just like, bro, like you got the gift of gab, you know, you know how to talk to people. You're really friendly. You should be a cop. And I got tired of corporate America, man. I mean, it's just a numbers game. Like yeah. any business, of course, I understand that. But I just needed something different. And yeah. for a lot of us, it comes back to fulfillment. Because at that time, before I transitioned to a cop, I was already making 100K during that time. I was... In my mid twenties, I had just bought my first condo, um, had a nice car, was able to go to vacations, was able to take care of my family, but I still wasn't happy. So transitioning to police work, like the first day I actually wore the uniform, dude, like I was like truly proud. Mm. It was just like, like the aha moment, you know, when you do something you really love. Right. And for me, that's, dude, I just pushed it to the limit. I was very proactive cop. I was just like, I want to be a commander. I want to mentor thousands of cops. I want to like, just really make a difference. And after going to a task force, after dealing with certain, you could say, uh, individuals being in certain situations where I've been shot at, I mean, I've, <laughs> I've had to raid hundreds of houses, not going to the unknown, but it, it could be that one time that something happens and you don't go home. Right. So just think, thinking of the bigger picture, thinking about the future and, I went and I started talking to a friend of mine and he got stuck on analysis paralysis with ATMs out yeah. of everything, man. Yeah. And I know it sounds weird. You're a cop, bro. Why would you go and like start investing into ATMs? Well, to be honest with you, I was also a worker. I was working 60 to hundred hour work weeks a week. I was making close to $250,000 a year as a cop, Dang. but it was blood money, dude. I didn't think cops cops made money like no, that. No one, no one ever thinks that, but in California, you can make a ton of money as a cop. There was guys making almost half a million dollars, but they weren't going home. They also had multiple divorces. They had multiple kids. Yeah. Like they just, their personal life just went to shit, dude. Yeah. And that's just the way it was. That was like basically the funnel I was going through, like the path I was going through. And I was just like, dude, I'm not looking to work in this type of environment. It was so toxic. You know, I was probably... 50 pounds less than what I am now. Mm. Um, I wasn't taking care of myself. I was about the job. I was just like, man, I really got to take control of my life. So that's when I started looking into side hustles. I was just like, what's simple enough that I'm actually able to make that extra overtime money work for me. Right. And essentially that's when I started talking to my friend who actually has been looking into the ATM business at that time for like three more uh, plus years. And he was just like, yeah, it's a great opportunity. So then I asked him, I was just like, well, how come you haven't started it? He's just like, I don't know. Something's holding me back. Yeah. So that's uh, later on, I started learning about analysis paralysis, how somebody can look at like an opportunity and just get stuck. Do you, because, do you think that, you know, I mean, a lot of people struggle with analysis paralysis, right? We see it all the time and um, people trying to get started in real estate or any business, social media, whatever. Do you think that being a cop and seeing so much made you like, dude, what the heck? Like, why am I going to be scared of doing this? What's the worst that can happen? Yeah, you hit it on the point, man. No, yeah. you're you're absolutely right. Um, if you're already a confident person and you get into law enforcement or you get into the military, it's just going to double your confidence because why? They train you to be in charge. They train you to control any type of situation, no matter what it is. And even the first couple of months that I was a sworn police officer, I've I was in situations where I've never thought I would be in, man. Like, you know, uh, crazy vehicle accidents or possibly like different situations where it was just like heinous crimes. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I always had to go, go back and rely on my training and experience of academy and what they trained me to do. What some of the best trainers that actually were my mentors during that law enforcement time when I was a cop, they told me, hey, man. You want to take care of the situation? 
but always know that you could go back and fix it. So just stick with your decision and you could go ahead and actually take care of any situation. Yeah. So that's the mindset I had, man. I was able to go in there and actually take care of business with ATMs, literally started within two weeks from the time that I actually spoke with that coworker. I was just like, you know what? It's black and white business. It's been around for long. It's proven. And it's very simple. You buy your machine, you find a location, uh, you're able to negotiate with the business owner no matter where you place it. You want the business to actually be cash driven. And at the end of the day, hey, you're basically having a conversation. You're giving them the options. You're educating them. And just like any business deal, luckily I had some experience from corporate America uh, where people buy you, man. Yeah. So at the end of the day, as long as you're able to educate them, build foundation, build value, hey, you're going to win all day. Yeah. And that's what I was able to do, man. So within the first two weeks, I was able to land six locations. Mm. Here's the thing though. <laughs> Just, I always like to talk about the good and the bad. Entrepreneurs, if you want to grow your business, there is no better investment than your own personal brand. The smartest thing I ever did was start creating content and investing into my brand. Ever since then, we've been able to triple our business. I've been able to raise more money than ever to continue buying more real estate. And it's all because I create content just like this. Now, a lot of people have asked me, Ryan, how am I supposed to do it? I don't know where to start. I don't know who's going to edit it. I don't know even what kind of setup or camera or anything to do. Well, here's the thing. We can help you with all of that at Pineda Media. We have a podcast checklist that you can actually get for free at PinedaMedia.com that's going to go over everything you need on starting a podcast. But to make matters even better, we'll actually edit your podcast for you. We'll repurpose it into short form clips like you see on my Instagram and my TikTok so that people will start seeing those clips and watching your podcast and in turn being customers or investors in your business. So if you want the one-stop solution where you can get everything done for you, plus get the education you need to grow your personal brand, then you need to go to PinedaMedia.com and book a free call with our team. You can also go get that free podcast checklist in that training program, absolutely free by just going there. So go check it out. Good thing is I wasn't scared to start it. The first step is always the biggest step when it comes to entrepreneurship. But here's the thing. I'm a big believer now in self-education. And I wasn't because I wasn't studious growing up. I wasn't a book reader when I was, you know, growing up and all that jazz until I got into law enforcement, had to write literally hundreds of thousands of police reports, search warrants, all that jazz. So I had to learn a little bit more about typing, articulating, describing, right? Because when you go to court six years later, after you've already written that report, guess what? Yeah. They're going to be digging into what you wrote, man. So you got to remember exactly how to write it. So... After I did that, I was able to scale from uh, those six ATMs to 30 ATMs within 18 months. Mm. The reason why I was able to do that, your network is your net worth. So I was able to meet somebody online, okay? I was able to meet somebody online on the Facebook groups. And um, the Facebook groups is huge. It's like your own little community depending on your niche. That's why I'm such a big believer now and I use it now in all my digital companies as well. I think that's one of the biggest needle movers behind any program, any establishment. If you're able to use the online space, hey, it's so easy to go ahead and market the product or the service that you want to provide out there. So I was able to do some connections, uh, get some connections with um, a couple of mentors. Well, I, I like to call my mentors that basically showed me the game mm -hmm. um, and exactly what to do to execute it properly. They were able to go ahead and actually provide me networks where there was a group of investors already deploying dispensaries throughout California. So, so these, was, these, these investors already had ATMs or they were just buying them for people like you? No. So the investors, they actually were part of a group that were investing into dispensaries. So oh, dispensaries. So yeah, dispensaries. Yeah. So because my mentor was able to go ahead and actually have that connection with the investment group. He introduced me because he was in Southern California. I was in the Bay Area. So he didn't have someone he can trust to go ahead and set them up properly with the business. And with any business, it's about delegation. I mean, I think we were just talking about that. It's amazing that you're able to work 20 to 30 hours and have seven businesses, man. Right now, currently I have three businesses, but I'm working as much or more than I was as a detective. And it's just as stressful, man. <laughs> yeah. But it's just because I'm still learning. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, that's just what it is. So when it comes down to it, I was able to go ahead and they, number one, they liked the fact that I was still a cop. Yeah. So they were like, dude, you're a cop and you're going to provide us the ATMs? Hell yeah. Like, 
go ahead. Yeah, we you, trust you. Yeah, we trust you. Like, yeah. you got it. And it's all about building the rapport. So I was like, yeah, man, let's do it. So I was able to get multiple locations throughout the Bay Area. Um, that essentially made me financially free. So my bills at that time was around $6,000. Okay. Yeah. Living in the Bay Area, which in the Bay Area. That, so, wait, so let me just take a step back here. Sure. So these guys funded your first six ATMs. No, I funded my, my you funded, how much did those cost? So at that time, ATMs were $2,100. Were they used new brand new, a, a brand new ATM was 2,100 bucks. Mm -hmm. And that's just buying it outright. You owe the ATM company, nothing else. So it depends who you go with. And that's one of the learning curves that I actually went through when I first started. Okay. I went with a big corporation. I don't like to bad mouth companies. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we're just going to say anonymous, but this big corporation, they actually had me sign a three-year contract where they would take a percentage of my residuals yeah. from surcharge profits. Okay. At that time, I didn't know that they were giving me a discount off of the ATM because I look at the uh, what, what I'm basically dropping as far as how much money I'm paying for the ATMs, just like any new on entrepreneur getting into any yeah you want venture. to get into it for as cheap as possible of course man so i go there and i tell them like okay well what if i buy six okay well, we could do it for 2100 each so then i end up buying the six they tie me into a three-year contract start taking percentages of my surcharge profits now if i was to get into the atm game i would tell anybody like number one never sign a contract yeah like that's a big no that's a that's that's a gem and then number two always keep 100% of your search profits because a lot of the ATM processing networks out there, yeah, they're providing you the networks just like uh, like a cell phone, right? Like Verizon or AT&T, but they're getting paid on the back end interchange fees, right? So they're yeah. getting paid by the banks and all that jazz. That's how they're making their money. And even though it's only a few cents a transaction, it adds up. You have a few hundred people under you that, are, that have hundreds of machines. You're making tens, yeah. if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So when I looked at it, that was the first deal that I did to get my machines. I was just like, dude, when I talked to my mentor, he was just like, get out of that contract, pay whatever they want, but get out of that contract. I ended up paying $7,000 to get out of that contract. So you paid, did you keep the ATMs? Yes. Okay. So you basically prepaid the, like what would they have cost to have zero, per, zero surcharge? Zero surcharge. Um, well, zero, zero profit split, I should say. Oh, zero profit split. We didn't even get to that part because I was so new and I didn't fully educate myself on actually how to negotiate the different deals. So you ended up paying seven grand on mm -hmm. top of like the 12 ish that you had already paid. Correct. But this is a year after. Yeah. So they made money on surcharge mm -hmm. and everything else. And, but then you owned them outright. Correct. So every, all the profit goes to you at that point. Yes. How does it work with the owner? of the place you're storing it at. Yeah, absolutely. So based on how you actually frame your offer, right? I could go into a liquor store, for example, that you own. Hey, Ryan, I can offer you the machine. I can offer you the service. I can refill the actual ATM for you. So you don't have to do that. Um, and usually owners, they'll say like, sounds good to me. Yeah, it's free money. It's free money, right? And I can save you on your credit card processing, right? At that time. And uh, they like it. So it's free money. So some of them, they won't ask for anything, right? It's just good business. Others, average is about 20% or so. Um, they get 20% of the surcharge. Correct. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you know, you said you bought six and I mean, what does the ATM make? I've always wondered this. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the average is around 200 to up to $1,000. That's the average that you can see in ATM, what they will make out there in the market right now. In a month. In a month, correct. So your location is just going to determine all that. Just like everything else, my friend. Location, location, location. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. But what I like about ATMs, Ryan, and this is something that I actually had to learn throughout the years, it's a floating asset. It's not like right now you buy a house, okay, for example, and you're trying to rent it out. And then all of a sudden, COVID part three happens, right? And you have no renters. Right. ATM, guess what? If it's not doing money at the location, just, just move, move it. it. Yeah. So simple, man. You're investing into an asset that's just going to generate more money and money. And it was a key needle mover for me. Why? Because my lack of time, man. I was working 60 to 100 hour work weeks until I was able to actually have those assets cover my bills, which then I only worked the straight 40. And then I got into digital marketing and now we're here, right? Yeah. This might be a dumb question. Sure. But who uses ATMs anymore? Like at a 
liquor store or whatever, like if they take credit, why would you even use an ATM? Yeah, no, gr great question, man. <laughs> like I, I never get, understood that. <laughs> I get that. I get that. That's like the number one objection we always get, dude, but cash is going away. Like, but you, you sell Bitcoin ATMs, but you know, what's, what's going on with like the fed coin, you know? And I get that it's because people watch the news. News is usually negative. It yeah. is what it is. But 25% of the market in the United States actually is unbankable. And no one talks about this. You know why? Because we're scared of getting canceled out. So, I mean, I like to be honest with my clients. I like to be honest when people ask me this, um, unbankable. Let's, let's get to that. What does that mean? That means people that have criminal histories, people that have bad financial backgrounds, um, immigrants, I come from an immigrant family. So at the end of the day, if you're an immigrant, you're not going to go apply for a bank account. Yeah. You're scared to do that. You know? But don't you need a bank account to get from the ATM? You do. But char third-party charge cards. So you got people that use the third-party charge cards. They end up paying for that, a monthly fee. They could put their money in and out. They usually don't ask for a bank account when it goes to that because you're using the actual company's third-party charge card. EBT cards as well. How do you and pay those cards then? How do you pay those cards? Yeah, like you use it, then how do you pay it off? Usually they have like a like a platform or, or whatnot that you're able to use to actually like use those cards. But I know that you didn't need, they would usually offer it back then, like no bank account needed. Yeah, I'm just like, so do you just go inside a store or their headquarters and you just pay them what, what's you, owed? Usually I would see a lot of the liquor stores in the low income neighborhoods. Yeah. They would have a lot of those, man. Where and you to, pay your card off. Correct. Okay. And then also you got to think about it like this. Who's the avatar of the business? Right. Right. 75% of the United States right now is not going to use cash. That's fine. But the ATM industry still has their avatar, just like any business, right? You provide... Uh, investors or you provide a clientele that's looking into real estate information primarily. Yeah. At the end of the day, somebody that's looking for other type of businesses yeah. or other ventures, they're probably not going to check out your content. They're probably going to check out someone else's who's specific on that niche. Yeah. So it's the same thing with the ATMs, just like the ATMs, the AT, uh, the, the merchant services or the, the Bitcoin ATMs as well. Yeah. Um, and I learned all I've seen that the Bitcoin ATMs. Like who's okay. So who's using the Bitcoin ATMs? I'm a big crypto guy, but I'm just like, wait a minute. Who like, why? <laughs> I love that objection. So wealth builders, if you are trying to grow your real estate investing business, then you need to join us at wealthy investor. If you have no idea what wealthy investor is. It is our coaching program and community. We have helped thousands of students worldwide grow their business. Now, it doesn't matter if you're just getting started and you're trying to get that first deal. We can help you do that. If you're trying to scale your business and go from a few deals a year to a few deals a month or even seven figures a year, we can help you do that too. In fact, last year alone, we had over 30 students do over a million dollars in revenue. And I'd love for you to be the next one. So it's pretty simple. If you're trying to grow your business and wholesale more homes or flip more homes or buy more rental properties, then you need to go to wealthyinvestor.com and book a free call with our team. It's super simple. We'll go on a strategy call with you and figure out how we can help you grow according to your needs. So all you got to do is go to wealthyinvestor.com, book the free call with the team, and we'll see you there. Bitcoin ETMs, let's transition to that. Let me ask you this. Online exchanges. How, may, how much time does it take from the time that you sell, let's say, a Bitcoin on your online platform? Say so use Coinbase, right? Whatever. And then you go and you actually transfer it to your bank account. How long will that take? It depends what account, yeah, but it'll take days. Days, right? Yeah. What if you need it instantly? Okay, you go to the... ATM Bitcoin machine. That's right. You get it within minutes. How does it work? So the way it works is you essentially go to the machine, you enter cash, okay? But you have to have an external wallet to receive the actual Okay, so you Bitcoin. can't use Coinbase. Correct. Or MetaMask. You got to have your ledger. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's correct. So you have your external one, you hook it up to the machine, and the machine gives you cash. Correct. How much? Uh. Our machines go up to thirty thousand dollars. Dang! Yeah, so they, they can trade a whole Bitcoin. Yeah, and get twenty five grand it's, cash. It's pretty good, man. Okay, so what's the fee on that? That's got to be a lot. Yeah, it's well, uh, it goes up to fifteen percent. Okay, so, so that's lucrative. It's, but but it, there's not many people doing it. Well, that's the sweet part about it, Ryan. So think about it like this: so ATM together, if formed from 
basically just focusing on cash ATMs. Okay. To now transform into multiple offers. Right. Right. And you have to grow just like a business. So around the end of the second year, I had a few people reach out to me from actual like companies, like crypto companies that were like, hey man, we like what you're doing with the online space and ATMs. What if we could work out where you can white label us? Okay. Where essentially they have all of the documents ready to go, especially with crypto. You know how the federal government is with regulating all that jazz. So this company in particular, btmmachines.com, they came to us. Guy's been in the ATM industry for about 20 plus years. Really nice guy out of Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I actually did a reel with him where he makes $50,000 net from a casino as well. But he's a big time player in the ATM industry. And he comes to me, he's like, hey man, been following your content. Love what you're doing. Let's team up. We want to use basically your client acquisition system online and then your sales team and then we will handle fulfillment. Sounds like a win-win. Okay, what, what, explain the whole Bitcoin venture. Well, we're charging people 15% to take out Bitcoin to sell the Bitcoin inside of these machines. Okay, so how does it work for the client? How does it benefit the client? Well, the client, they can actually own the machine. They can own the machine. We will actually provide the crypto. We will provide our wallet. We will provide the cash. So these guys, they actually have the armored vehicle services and they load up the cash in these machines. There's a lot of cash in there. There's a lot of cash in there. Yeah. But at the end of the day, um, we take security measures. We take security measures. We vet the locations. We make sure the locations are good to go. And Who's all on the, the hook if it gets robbed or something? <sighs> uh, the actual company, the fulfillment company. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got so it. they have insurance and all that for that. We use but if you own your own normal ATM, what happens if the liquor store gets robbed? So you have a couple options. You can actually get insurance, third-party insurance that actually covers the cash. Okay. Okay. So let's say if you have like three or four ATMs in a dispensary and you're running like ADGs and recurring, you know, cash flow going through that machine, you're making, I don't know, $4,000 a month net from those machines, right? Really right. good spot. Um, and they do some type of heist in right. there. You can always get insurance. They'll cover the cash for you. You just got to replace the machines. And the got machines it. right nowadays, they're only, they're still like $2,200. Okay. Got it. So not that, not that expensive. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyways, you partner with the Bitcoin guy. You start launching Bitcoin machines everywhere. Yeah, so December of uh, 2022, actually, it's a, it's sort of a trip because uh, this is where, like, you know, I also partnered up with uh, my business partner here for the merchant services. But I, I forgot he was here. Dude. <laughs> John, the audience, <laughs> the audience is like, who is this? Oh, yeah, there's another guy here. <laughs> Paul's taking up all the airtime, dude. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. John, you exist, right? Yes, yes. I'm here. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know where John's story comes in, so, so I'm just so, going to keep so listening. It's going to come in right after this, guys. <laughs> okay. Trust me, I don't like to, to hog the, the mic. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Ryan, so December of 2022, we basically built the, all the infrastructure, all the online um, digital marketing uh, aspect of it. And then we started rolling clients in. Um, <sighs> we've been getting some amazing results, to be honest with you. On average, our clients, after three to six months of placement because you need time to nurture and also we're directing the traffic to them. So it's pretty cool. Usually with your traditional ATM, you're relying on heavy foot traffic. With, hey, you're not marketing for it. You're not really marketing so it. So you're marketing these Bitcoin machines. Yeah, man. And okay. that's the game changer because we're yeah. able to use SEO. We're able to use Google. We have a whole marketing team that just- Because that's your background. Yeah, man. Marketing. Yep. Okay. We're, we're, going in, we're going in there and we're pushing the traffic to the client. Got and it. And if the client's already making $1,000 to $4,000 a month net off of this, man, I mean, they're selling what? Two to three Bitcoins? And it doesn't matter if it goes up and down. Regardless, whoever owns the machine- they're getting a nice chunk of that 15%. We're in partners, yeah, yeah, right? And that's the best it. way to do it, man. Yeah. You know, just be in partnerships where we get a percentage, they get majority of the profits. Yep. But at the end of the day, it's still brand new to the market. One of the biggest Bitcoin actual ATM companies out there, they just got on NASDAQ, Bitcoin Depot. Okay. And their CEO, they said on average, their average BTM right now, which they have over 3,000 nationwide, is making $7,000 a month. That's crazy. Crazy money. Yeah. So just imagine, there's supposed to be some type of- You said of they got 3,000? 3,000 of them. Correct. And right now, they're trying to buy out the smaller companies. Ah. Yeah. So we're-, we're one And they're already publicly traded? Yeah. Wow. They just got on NASDAQ, I think about a month, month and a half, two months ago. 
Yeah. Got it. Okay. So it's it's phenomenal, dude. Like if you see other companies like that, they're they're growing, they're yeah, especially the as crypto, you know, gets in its next bull run, you know. Oh, it's yeah. And and when's the bull run supposed to happen? Oh man. I mean, I'm not here to call out predictions, but the next What do you think? What are your the, thoughts? Well, I mean, it always follows the having, and that's in April next year. That's right. So so we're thinking like March, April. And all of our clients right now, man, I mean, we currently have a little bit over 350 uh, BTM owners. Yeah. They're all, they're all like, prepping. let's go, let's yeah. go, right? But yeah. they're already making decent returns already. Like I said, it's awesome. Um, the fact that they could remotely own these. And I think that's one of the biggest needle movers for us on our offer. It's it's no brainer when it comes to that, is that someone from San Francisco can own a machine in Miami. And it's cool because we're running all the logistics for them. We just ask for a percentage of their proceeds and we're upfront with that and yeah. they're okay with that. Mm. So it's pretty cool. No, awesome. So where merchant services comes into play and you know, I know, I know you've, you've been looking at the logo, man. Yeah, yeah. big logo. <laughs> yeah. So how I got into that is essentially your network is your net worth. And I know you, you know about that, man. I mean, you know, all the big players right now, like Grant Cardone, Hamazi, mm -hmm. all those guys. So the way I met my business partner, John, and I started getting into credit card machines is that um, my current ISO for my ATM venture with ATM together, my independent sales organization guy, he provides the network. He actually supplements the actual machines for us. So he takes care of the fulfillment for my company for the cash ATMs. He was at a conference and um, he got approached by John's co-founder of their company, Paybotics, out of Los Angeles. They've been in business for about 15 years. They approach him, they're like, hey, hey, dude, who the heck is this guy with this big Facebook group with uh, for ATMs? Uh -huh. Like, what's up with this? We were like, we need to do something like this. Mm. How many people did you have in the group at the time? At that time, I probably have a little bit over 50,000. 50,000, yeah, that's a big group. <laughs> right right, right yeah. now, right now, it's around 60... 65. That's just a free group. It's a free group, man. Yeah. Just add value. And, yeah. and I mean, we could talk about digital marketing all day, dude. Cause it gets yeah. me excited. I want to, I want to listen to John too. So yeah. we'll talk about digital marketing after I, I realize that John's not going to kill me. You know, <laughs> he's not just like an assassin over there. <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. But, um, yeah. So basically my ISO met with his business partner and they were like, yeah, that's Paul cool. Let's set up a meeting. We set up a meeting, man. And, uh, they basically showed me the light with one of the leading programs within merchant services, which is called cash discount program. But I think I'm going to let John take over that part, man. Yeah. John, explain to me what merchant services is. Cause a lot of people don't know. Yep. Oh, very good. Uh, so merchant services. Um, so I've been in the industry for 18 years and essentially merchant services is processing of credit card and debit card transactions. So there's a network behind it. Oftentimes, everybody thinks you go to a restaurant, you give your, you hand your card over, they swipe it. You know, the money comes from your bank, goes to the merchant's bank. Uh, but there's a, companies behind the scenes that are doing that, uh, processing companies. And then we partnered, we're an ISO with Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express that we're able to sign up business owners to be able to process credit cards. Okay, got it. So you guys are just the little thing that's at every register, yeah. right? Credit card machine or yeah. POS system. Okay. And so you guys supply the merchant with that system and the merchant still will get charged whatever they get charged. You guys take a cut? Like yeah, that, so, how does it so, work? So uh, Visa, MasterCard, Discover American Express, they create what's called interchange fees, which is the wholesale cost that they charge the business owner to be able to process these cards and fund the whole network behind to makes it a secure transaction. Okay. Okay. Um, these companies, uh, they, they, they register us as an ISO or a registered ISO independent sales organization. And um, they give us the wholesale interchange and say, go ahead and sign up the business owner and you put, you put on your profit on top of the interchange. Got it. So a typical like interchange is 3%. That's kind of the industry standard. Okay. So that's what most, that's what most people think that okay. the interchange is. Uh, that's what most business owners can be charged anywhere from three to 10% actually. Jeez. Yeah. 
and, and, and who's paying 10%? What's <laughs> so it's, it's funny. Um, I just got a statement from a dentist office in Alabama and they're paying seven and a half percent. How, like, what are they doing? Yes. So it, <laughs> it, it, it was, what, so what's crazy is, you know, you think about say a bank of America, Wells Fargo and chase. Okay. Uh, Wells Fargo just sent me a check for $25. I closed my account like six years ago. What happens is you you go to Bank of America and you say, I need a merchant account for my dentist office. They say, okay, hey, here you go. You don't ask a lot of questions. They sign you up. They give you an introductory rate. And over the years, it starts climbing. They start just, bam, let's raise it. Let's raise it. Let's raise it. You're not paying attention. You're paying attention to your dental office. Uh, and slowly, your rates have gone up to 7.5%. Hmm. Okay, that's when we come in as an agent and say, hey, Ryan, let me take a look at your statement. You know, oh, no, I'm paying, I'm, I'm with Stripe, I'm paying 3%. Are you sure about that? Let me take a look at your statement. Now you, I see your statement, I uncover a lot of hidden fees mm. that you're paying. Why, how do they get away with these fees? Like, cause like, I'm like, man, let me check mine right now. Okay, what's Stripe doing that they yep. could be charging for that's not being seen. Yep, because most people, most business owners are so busy running their business, you know, managing their employees um, that they don't have, that they just see it as, a, as something that they need, but they don't really know they can, they can negotiate it. And a lot of times if you sign up, let's say you sign up with Stripe or Bank of America, you don't have somebody you can call. You've got to call an 800 number. And that's like, man, I got to be on the phone 30 minutes for an 800 number, they're gonna transfer me here. I don't have time to de deal with that right now, okay? As opposed to me, when I sign up a client, I say, Ryan, here's your machine, here's your equipment. Any questions you have, Ryan, don't hesitate to call me. Yeah. Boom. You're gonna call me, I'm gonna handle it for you. And that's how we get accounts from the big banks. So I guess, where do you make your margin? Cause you're, you're, <laughs> you're just lowering their fee essentially. Yes. Well, you're getting rid of like this, these hidden, but you're still like- We're still profiting. Yeah, how? Okay, so now uh, what's been introduced over the last few years is what's called the cash discount program. Okay, so uh, what we've done because of inflation, it's allowed us to go to business owners and say, look, you're getting killed on inflation. Your uh, employees' wages have gone up. Everything's going up. So now um, what we're able to do is we're able to program your equipment to transfer the fees that you're paying, 3 to 4%, onto the, your customers, right? Okay. And that's more acceptable now because during the pandemic, it trained all of us to order food online. Yep. Okay. DoorDash, Uber Eats, and we all get charged a delivery fee, mm -hmm. a service, service fee, fee. Yep. you know, and then you, you still give a tip. Yep. So because of that, the pandemic trained everybody that it's okay to pay a service fee. So now that is becomes more profitable for us because instead of us going to the business owner and say, oh, let me lower your rates or say, we're not lowering your rates. We're just passing them on over here. So our profit stays the same. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, it's funny. Side note is the pandemic. I remember, you know, if I, I wouldn't do takeout that much, but like if I ever did do takeout, I mean, it's not like I'd be tipping 20%. I'd be just given whatever. I'd be like five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks if it was like a big thing. And then I just remember during the pandemic, I was like, dude, I feel bad for these businesses, you know, like they're not getting tips. And so I was just tipping 20% plus. And then like, it's pretty much been a habit. And I don't like, in my mind, I want to be generous and like, I'm good with it. But now I think about it and I'm like, wait a minute, you know, I'm paying my server the same that I'm paying takeout. Mm -hmm. Like this kind of doesn't make sense that I'm doing that. Um, so maybe I just need to pay the server more if I'm going to keep doing that. I don't know. But the point is, to your point, like <laughs> inflation and fees and every, I would have never paid 20% on takeout. That makes no sense. But then again, I'm like, well, I want to support these small businesses. Yeah, absolutely. And then it comes, it also comes down to what is your time worth? You know, a lot of times I don't have time to go to the grocery store, so I'm going to have the groceries delivered to me. Because, well, that's a different thing, though. Yeah. You're, a delivery is like you're actually doing a service. Yeah. Take out. You're not doing anything for me. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know. Let me know in the comments, guys, if I'm like out of line. I don't know. But like. It just, it's just, it's weird that the guy who's the server or the delivery guy who's actually performing a service mm -hmm. is getting paid the same as. Yeah. The takeout. Guy. Yeah. When I, yeah. when I pick up takeout, I, t I normally don't leave a tip. Yeah. Um, because you know, it's, you're really doing your own work. It's not like they're doing the work. Yeah. 
Well, I'm just saying like, I used to, well, I would still give like a little bit, but the habit from the pandemic of, well, dude, they're not getting anything right now. Yep. Let me tip them what they should have got. I mean, Ryan, right now, like specifically in California, I mean, even in Florida where I just moved, as soon as you check out anywhere, man, you could get a coffee at Starbucks. There's like the tip charge right there, $2 yeah. to $3. And then they punished them recently because of something, but like they punished them where they took it away yeah. right for a bit. But it's just so common now that people don't even look at the fees. They're just like, okay, they're, they're used to yeah, it. I, yeah. I do it on my ice cream. I do it on my Ube. I just like, <laughs> I'm just like, whatever. It's 20%, like everywhere it's 20%. Yeah. And I don't know. I make money. So I'm like, whatever. But like <laughs> even the other, the, the generous side of me is like, I make money. So like, let's help them out. But the capitalist side of me, I don't want to say the capitalist side of me, but like also like the hard worker side of me is like, dude, you got to earn what you get too. Right. You know? Yeah. It all comes down to convenience. I mean, yeah. at, at the end of the day, why, why do people buy into like courses, programs and, you know, in the online space right now, you know, courses, they get such a bad name, mm -hmm. but I get it it's because there's a lot of people out there that are not supposed to put out courses that they don't have the experience and all that. Yeah, does. Yeah. But essentially it's just like, I'm such a big believer in self-education now where it's like, dude, I'm going to go and spend the money. I'm going to spend 10, 30,000 to learn it from that person. Yeah. Cause I'm going to take what they learn and then make more money off of it. Way more, you know? So it's a convenience, man. And that's, and that's what it is. The online space. We basically combined new school digital marketing yep. with uh, old school business. You just and, been in merchant forever. <laughs> and, and, and that's it, you know, and he's able to bring in like his sales team, his fulfillment team, like his knowledge. And that's the biggest thing, man. Like if I'm able to learn, everything that he knows for the past 15 to 18 years that he's been in merchant services. I mean, his company just alone has generated over nine figures and he has a wealth of knowledge. So that's what we're bringing into the table nowadays. We're just exposing what people don't know because what yeah. you don't know is what you don't know, man. Yeah. You know, it's just like when I learned ATMs from my coworker who got stuck on analysis paralysis yeah. and then a few, and then a few years later, I mean, six years later, right. But six years later, he's hitting me up like, How's everything going, man? You know, I was just like, "What? How's the department?" He's still there, you yeah. know, and he's about to retire. But it's just, yeah, it is what it is, man. Yeah, you know? no, it makes sense. Yeah. So you guys are now um, in the merchant service businesses. I mean, you, like you said, you're still doing ATMs. You get the Bitcoin, yes. and then now you're doing merchant services, which is providing the payment processor to yeah. these businesses. And this could be any business, right? Yep. Restaurants, retail tire stores, online businesses, uh, plumbers, pretty much everything. Everything. Because I've seen a lot of these different machines, like, you know, you got the little black one that's like small. Yep. And then, you know, you got that white one that's like, that's the Clover, the yeah, Clover the clo Station. We, yeah. we, we, we sell the Clover Station as well. That one to me looks like the most premium, is it? Yeah, it's one of the top of the lines. We, we have a, uh, there's a, there's a ton of them out there. Uh, different machines um, we have mobile machines we have wireless machines there's ones that do you in your phone yep there's I've ones done those like the cart girl in golf always mm -hmm. has one yes yeah we have those we call them the mobile swipers yeah okay absolutely uh, but the beauty about the whole industry is that the reason i've been in it for so long and the reason i got into it is because of the residual income okay if i can sign up this restaurant right down the road here um, just, I was look, tell them on the way here, said, Oh, see that Mexican restaurant. We can sign that up. Okay. All we do is we go talk to the owner. We put it in a machine. I'm going to make two, $300 a month on that account. Yeah. Okay. It's just a sales game. Yeah, absolutely. You just got to like talk to it's, as many as you can and convince them to it's, switch. It's about building relationships. Yeah. And my motto has always been make a friend, make a sale. Right. Okay. I'm going to go in. I'm going to say, Hey, Ryan, how you doing? How's everything? How's the business running? Oh, wow. Good, good and bad. Okay, great. Well, you know, I'm in the, I'm in, my name is John Sarabia. I'm with Merchant Services and I can provide you the machine. I can sh save you money or just eliminate your fees completely. Right. Okay. Now we're building a relationship. Who do you work with? We process through Fiserv, Global Payments. And a lot of times they're already using those companies anyways. The way uh, you eliminate their fee is by just making it a service fee. Yeah. By making it a service fee and passing it on to the customer. Right. Okay. Absolutely. And the way it works is like we, an example, I have a tire store in Los Angeles area. That's 250 to $300,000 a month in sales. Okay. Okay. They've been a client of ours for over six years. We put them on this 
cash discount program a year ago. And um, it, that generates about $5,000 a month in residuals. For you guys. For us, yes. Got it. That's one tire store. How many okay. loca- How many stores are you guys in? We're, we're in over 15,000 locations nationwide. Jeez. Yeah. That's a lot of residual, dude. Yeah. We've been, we've been in, I've been That's in doing 18 this, years of residual. I've been doing this for 18 <laughs> years. Exactly. Dude. And, and actually, um, the last few years, you know, my partner, and I, we've been semi-retired. We're doing real estate. We're doing Airbnbs. Yeah. Um, I'm actually working. That's on, way less passive than this. Yeah. <laughs> John, John, well, you got to no. keep it real, man. So yeah. what I was yeah. telling him is like, no, this is uh, merchant services is actually really passive. I have a yeah. client that's been um, that I've signed up six years ago. Yeah. Installed that Clover machine. And I haven't talked to him in six years. Yeah. Okay. Um. Like I was telling them, I have Airbnbs. I don't talk to my payment processor at all. Mm -hmm. I don't have a, I mean, we've tried um, a couple, but it's like, I don't have a representative at Stripe who I'm like hitting up. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And like, you know, I have Airbnbs and, you know, one weekend I'm going in to put bleach in the pond. The other weekend, you know, we're doing this. And even though I have yeah, people. Yeah, no, Airbnb it, is not passive. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not <laughs> as passive. It's still fun though. You know, we, we still like real estate and, yeah, yeah. you know, doing creative financing and so forth. Uh, but this with, with, with residuals is like, you know, I could essentially retire and just yeah. be comfortable on my residuals. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're not losing accounts every day, things like that. It's, 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 there's not a lot of maintenance to, required. You don't have to share it, but like how much residuals are coming in a month off 15,000 locations? <laughs> It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a pretty good number. Uh, we have about over 200 sales agents. Is it, it's over seven figures a month. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Yep. And we, you know, you'll I, tell me off camera. I, I have some agents, <laughs> uh, Ryan, I have some agents that are making 20,000 a month residuals. The agents, cause the they agents. sold the store owner and you gave them a cut yes, of that. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. That's sick. <laughs> okay. And here's the greatest part about this, Ryan, the market's untouched for cash discount. Like I was asking, um, John, I was just like, Hey man, like I'm pretty sure Ryan, he's going to like probe and ask questions and, and ask like, Hey, I, I asked the I'm, questions that I want to know, which is if, good. Yeah. If I want to get into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But guess how much of the market right now, the U S market actually uses the cash discount program. Well, I don't even know what the cash discount is just not using your credit card. Just get them to use cash. Right. Exactly. Um, what would you say? How many people? So basically, how many people pay with cash? The percentage? No. How many business the owners are on this new program that I'm saying where they pass the service fee on? Oh, that, um, dude, none. I mean, <laughs> let me guess. I'll, I'll guess two percent. I would say about five. five yeah. You know, but five, ten percent on the high end. Yeah. Um. So it's like a, it's it's like a huge ocean, big just blue ocean, waiting for us to go yeah. get it. Yeah. You know what's funny is I was. You know, I, I, I've, I've noticed when companies do do it because I'm just mm-hmm. observing how people do business, right? And I'm always like aware of how people make money. And one business that I've always loved was payment processing. I'm like, dude, these freaking guys, they're making so much money for like something you can't avoid. It's crazy. Right? And like, it just is what it is. I'm like, Stripe, I cannot believe they make so much money off of us for nothing. And then I was just thinking like, Visa, and all these things, it's like they're charging 3%. Like, even if they don't make their interest, they're still making a lick every transaction. And I was like, how many transactions Visa doing a day in the world? Just millions. It's That's crazy. crazy. Um, so, yeah, like thinking through the the, mon- the side of money and credit, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is nuts. But anyway, side note, um, yeah, I was doing takeout at a different place. And, dude, I had a take order of like 200 bucks. And I was going to tip anyway, but, you know, I looked on my receipt and it had already been accounted for. It was like 18% service fee. And I was like, dang, mm-hmm. dude, like th- it's like that. Like yeah. they're going to just charge an 18% service fee That's right. on takeout right off the bat mm-hmm. on a $200 take. I'm like, I mean, thankfully I was going to just tip anyway, so I didn't really care, but I'm just like, that's aggressive. That's crazy that, you know, there, there's people that. They ain't going to be down with that because they don't tell you when you order at takeout. And, mm-hmm. and it happens so often. Yeah. I went to Atlanta, happened at a restaurant, went to Miami, went to a Bad Bunny's restaurant recently. Same thing. 20%, man. That's yeah. not even including the tip for the server. 
So at the end of the day, it's just people are already paying plus more. They well, just don't realize it. I mean, when I see that, I'm like, all right, well, that is the server's tip. That's how I perceive <laughs> it. I don't know. If you're charging 20%, that I've got to believe that that's the server's tip. So on some of the receipts I've been seeing at these restaurants, because I'm a big foodie, man. Yeah, yeah. So they, they started putting, this is not the tip for servers. So what do they do with <laughs> It's that? just a service fee. And then I ask, so what is this for? And they're like, uh, I had some restaurants say, well, it's in the event that you take out food, you know, for, for the materials and all that jazz. Um, for other ones, it's just for the, it's for the bus boys. Yeah. <laughs> they come up with some, so many no. different excuses. No, I think if you're going to charge 20% and you're going to say it's not the tip, like that's bad business in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you're going to charge three, 4%, whatever, right? Like I get that. You don't want to do the credit card fee and like inflation adjustment. I've seen them use that wording too, mm -hmm. but yeah. If you're charging 20%, you're forcing it. It's not even a party of six. It's just a takeout order. I'm like, all right, dude, this is, this is kind of ridiculous. No. Yeah. It's crazy, <laughs> but it complements basically the realm that I came from like ATM industry. Yeah. And it fit like a glove, man, because at the end of the day, if people wanted to use this cash discount program on the actual accounts that we are helping our clients with, yeah. then guess what? they could get paid both ways. Right. If they do want to take out cash, cool. Go put an ATM at the same store. Right. Take out cash. You still get your $3 or your $4, wherever you're at Vegas, your $5. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you're going to win either way. Yeah. So, Yeah, we just talked to uh, this morning. I was talking, well, I have an agent in Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee. Calls me up, puts me on the speaker. The owner of a mechanic shop that he's visiting is there. The owner's like, Thank you guys for, thank you, John, for sending uh, Gage out here, uh, helping me with this. I, he uncovered all these fees I was paying. I didn't even know that I was paying. He's like, another guy came by a year or two ago and said he was local and he never came back. He just disappeared. So there's a lot of business owners like that out there that are just like, somebody signed me up and, you know, I don't know who it they is. They were gone. They're gone. So that to me, and or when somebody says I'm with the bank, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, oh, that's awesome because yeah. I know the bank is overcharging. I know you don't have an agent. And so, you don't even know. And, and you don't even know. And once I look at the statement, they purposely send you a statement that can be 10 pages long. And it has a lot of information on there that you don't need. And <clears throat> the fees, even the way the percentage, the interchange rates are in there, um, they're just, it's make it very what, difficult. What's like the lowest the interchange rate can be? So on debit cards, it can be as low as 1%. Okay. Okay. On credit cards, it could be as high as 3.5%. So what's the lowest you've seen on credit cards? Oh, on credit cards, uh, about one point nine two percent two percent because what happens is most cards have rewards on them correct okay so essentially that's what is covering the cost of the rewards yeah okay uh but with debit cards you know it it could be we like it when a lot of debit cards are used because it's more profitable for us mm. okay so if i sign up a let's say i can i can sign up a ice cream shop in downtown los angeles a lot of business cards will be used in that ice cream store because they're business people, okay? As opposed to in the suburbs, people are going to be using their debit cards more. Interesting. Okay? So on that same ice cream store that's doing $100,000 a month, we're going to be more profitable on the one in the suburbs. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So, okay. Yep. Got it. That's insightful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the payment processing industry is just, it's wild. Yeah. Man. And we, we've, uh, we have a lot of reps out there. I always say, whether you're, a, you're, you're a housewife that wants to make $500 a month residuals, uh, signing up one account, and that's going to cover your car, your car insurance and your cell phone bill. And you're happy with that. Or you're a rep that says, Hey, I want to make 20, $30,000 a month. And I want to work from home and just chill. This is a side note. I'd love to hear you guys' opinion because you're kind of already doing it with crypto. But, you know, like one of the big benefits of crypto is it's instantaneous. You know, yes. it's not like paying a wire fee of 30 bucks and you got to pay 15 bucks to receive it. Then you got to, you know, wait hours. And if it's on the weekend, you can't wire. And so like, you know, with Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever you want to use, I can just send it to you immediately. Question, do you ever see these industries like, taking a big hit from that if people are able to just directly transact that's a great question i know it's a long time away yeah it's a very long, a very time, long time away, away. 
And I think we're just going to adjust and pivot just like any other company yeah. or industry has to demand. My thoughts on that is that there's going to be multiple options out there. Yeah. Just like when Square came out, just like when PayPal came out, just like when all these convenient offers came out. But at the end of the day, they're all companies, they're all businesses. They're going to charge their fees. Yeah. And that's what people have to understand. Nothing in life is free, man. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I think when it comes to it, I'm not scared that cash is going to go away. I personally do not think that cash is going to go away for the next 20 years. And it's going to be here to stay, even when we do get like when it's fully finalized with like Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, all the cryptos coming out, it's just going to be different options. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'll be kind of like what we're saying. It's like, all right, well, cash doesn't have this fee. You just mm -hmm. pay the cash. And I think crypto could be like that because you don't need a third party to and then, do it. And then also you got to think about it like this, Ryan, baby boomers right now. Do you think a lot of baby boomers are buying crypto? Do you think a lot no. of baby boomers? Yeah. It's going to, like you said, it's going to take, it 10, 20 years. It takes to, a very long time, man. Yeah, for everyone to transact that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been in the merchant services for 18 years and I've seen changes and you're like, oh, you know, same thing like with real estate. How is it, how is it going to affect us, you know, next year? The interest rates go lower. You know, how is it going to mess up the uh, real estate industry? And, you know, a lot of times you're going to adjust to yeah. whatever it is that is coming. Um, but merchant services has been around for a long time and it's going to be around for a very long time as well. Yeah. Okay. So I understand the products mm -hmm. and how they all make money. You know, we've been talking briefly about digital marketing, yeah. right? So tell me a little bit about how the digital marketing has been for all this. Oh man. Um, so starting from my last few years of being in law enforcement, uh, starting with ATMs, Becoming financially free from ATMs, I was able to stop working overtime. That helped tremendously because as you know, digital marketing is very time intensive in the beginning. Yeah. And then you could delegate, mm -hmm. you know, um, but it all started with one book. I read uh, Digital Millionaire by Dan Henry. Really great book. Um, ended up being a book funnel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ended, up, ended up booking a call with yeah. one of his consultants and just had that hard conversation, you know, like, hey man, it's 10 grand. Yeah. For, and I was just like, I'm not comfortable. I don't even know what I'm investing to. Like, should I do it? Should I do it? Okay, I did it. But what I told myself is, okay, number one, I have skin in the game now. Meaning that if I lose out on this 10,000, I can't blame no one else. Yeah. I can only blame myself. Right. So I'm taking accountability, man. And majority of people, that's what they won't do. They won't take that accountability. They won't take that responsibility that it's on them. Yeah. And for most of us, you know, it's all mindset, man. Mm -hmm. It's, you're going to determine what time you wake up. You're going to determine what time or what, what, what you have to do for that day. You're going to determine how hard you want to grow your empire. Mm -hmm. Realistically, do you have to have those, these seven businesses right now, Ryan? No, no. But why do you do the seven businesses? Because you probably see a bigger future for you and your family and for your, for your people. Right. Yep. So at the end of the day, it's the same thing with me, man. I have three businesses. I work as much as I used to back in law enforcement, but it's because I want to. I'm passionate about it, man. And I'm also building my tribe. Like yeah. right now we have 50 employees just internationally, right? And each one of them, like they're super happy to work under my organization because, hey, number one, it's a fun environment to work with. The culture is there. I'm super big in culture, man. And then I have some great leaders. Yeah. I was able to find some great leaders that actually implement like my visions, what I'm about, um, how hard I work and just leading by example, which I think it's, it goes with everything, man. You yeah. have to lead by example, you know? So digital marketing, I started investing into myself, got into around the 30 K to 50 K programs and courses, uh, which people thought it was crazy. I remember I was looking at the program, Dan Henry's program at that time. One of my coworkers who just got his master's degree uh, that week, he walked by. He's just like, hey, what is this, Paul? I was just like, oh, it's going to teach me basically how to build a program online and sell education. He goes, are you stupid? <laughs> Straight up. And you know, in law enforcement, there's no filter, dude, like especially yeah. between the cops. Yeah. And he's like, are you stupid? He's just like, dude, did you really just blow $10,000? You just got scammed. Yeah. That was the first thing that came out of his mouth. And yeah. I was just like, I'm not trying to hear it right now. I'm trying to like actually make this work. And you already did the ATM thing. Yeah. I already yeah. did the so ATM already, thing. Yeah. I, I was already very business minded. Everyone knew what I was doing yeah. already. And those guys already were like, why well, is this guy doing ATMs? So exactly. Like, you're like, I don't care. Whatever. Yeah. So at that time, my mindset was just like, dude, you guys are not going to pay my bills. 
you guys are not going to help me build what I'm building. You guys don't see what I see. You don't see the vision, right? And it was the exact same thing with my circle, with my family, with my ex. When I had initially told them what the whole ATM venture, they were like, that's silly. Why would you do that? You're a cop. You're yeah. going to be a sergeant. You know, I was coming up to five years uh, at that time and I was just, yeah, I was going to promote to be a sergeant. And then my, my dream was to be a commander. Yeah. So at the end of the day, man, I mean, it's just funny how life works because a critical incident can change your life forever, but then you can choose what you want to do with how it makes you feel at that moment. Right. And at that time I was scared. I was just like, I don't know anything besides being a cop. Yeah. Um, is this going to work? Um, I mean, I already tried ATMs and it worked out for me. So why can't I do digital marketing? And then as I started looking, I mean, I saw you in 2020 on TikTok when you first started doing TikTok. Mm -hmm. And I remember there, there was either, even other influencers that were copying like your, your stuff, bro. Yeah, yeah. I, it was crazy. I, I saw like the whole buildup of how you built everything. And I even bought one of your first programs. <laughs> I think it was like... You did like a pre, like a promotional for like, it was like 500 bucks. You reduced it to like, I don't know, like 250 or something. It was a discount rate. Yeah. yeah. Basically, if you're one of the first ones. Yep. So I was like, okay, cool. Bought it, looked at it. But you know what was my biggest fear? What? And I, I never said this on any podcast on anywhere. Okay. I was talking in front of the camera. Mm. Oh, so you bought the social media course? Yes. Okay. It was talking in front of the camera, man, because mm. it was just so weird. Like, I could talk from stage. Yeah. I've talked where I've led like, you know, cases with federal agents, FBI guys, DEA guys, whatever. Right. Right. That didn't scare me. I was used to that. But being alone in a room by and yourself. just by myself, have the camera and then have like possibly a hundred people watching me just from yeah. wherever the boons. It's that tough. was scary. It was yeah. tough, man, yeah. because you got to pump yourself up. Yeah. You got to bring the energy. Yeah. Right. You got to keep going, even though you're like, oh, I just messed up. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what a lot of people feared. So at that time, I I really feared being judged, to be honest with you. And that's mm. why that's what got me stuck on analysis paralysis because I kept buying so many things, man. I bought books, I bought courses, I bought, I bought your course. Yeah. Um, and I was just like, dude, Ryan's already like moving the needle and he has all this going on and it's working for him. It's just like, and I'm seeing all these other guys claiming to make a hundred thousand dollars a month, yeah. claiming to make millions, you know, uh, the old videos with, uh, consultants in the Ferraris in the back in the uh, old tie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah tie, man. You yeah. know, um, all that jazz. And I was just like, dude, what, what makes them so special? And it was, it comes back to, to mindset, man. Yeah. I think for all of us, especially with digital marketing, I believe if you're an expert in your niche, yeah, I believe if you have social proof in whatever you do in life, if you're an expert and you're passionate about it and you're able to educate others or mentor others, I believe you could create a million dollar program mm. at minimum within your first year. Mm. If you have the proven blueprint, because now the blueprint that I took to build a $18 million digital marketing company, ATM together with the ATM industry, yeah. you know, uh, two and a half years later. I just took the exact same infrastructure, which is not that difficult. Anyone can learn this. You just got to take the time to learn it or invest into someone who's going to teach you and then just duplicate the process, man. And that's what I did with, with merchant, you yeah. know, merchant services launched it in mid February, um, set up a very simple Facebook group. Yep. I ran, uh, have a Facebook ads team, yep. but I ran my Facebook ads when I first started, yep. you know, I didn't know. I just, a Udemy man, you know, you could buy like $20 <laughs> courses on how to learn Facebook ads. Yep. And I just did it, man. In perfect action. You know, mm. I didn't know everything. I know I might lose a little bit of money here and there, but that's part of the game, mm. right? We're entrepreneurs. Yeah. So you have to take that action. Otherwise you're just going to be stuck where you're at forever. Mm. I love it, dude. Yeah. You know, what's funny is, um, so, you know, obviously I released that course in 2020 and, yeah. um, you know, we don't really sell courses standalone too much anymore just because, people see a lot more results when they have coaching. Yes. Um, but one of the things I've realized with social media now, having done it for over three years is that, yeah, doing the solo camera thing is really hard for most people, right? I mean, think about it. It's not natural to just talk by yourself in a room to a camera, right? It's, it's weird. And it gets really weird when you're trying to do it as a TikTok or a reel, yeah. because now you're not even talking naturally how you speak. You're trying to chop it up as quickly as possible. And you're just like spurt sentences like that. Right. And so 
you know, I started an agency called Panetta Media to yeah. do, um, you know, content for entrepreneurs. And I started to realize, I'm like, man, dude, everyone's having so much struggle with the short form. It's yeah. tough just being by yourself, talking to a camera. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, obviously I've done it a million times now. And like, we have coaches who are coaching them through it. And like, you know, there's many who get it and like, they love it. And then there's some who are just discouraged yeah. because they're like, dude, even with a coach, this is so hard. And I'm yeah. like, well, you know, did you become a good salesperson? Like overnight? It's the reps. Yeah. You got to get reps in. Like nobody said social media is going to be this get rich quick tomorrow thing. No, you're, you're, do, you're building this for years. Exactly. Right. So anyways, um, we ended up pivoting to podcast mm. and I like podcasts better anyway, cause that's my, been my bread and butter for many years and it's just more efficient. You can repurpose the clips into the shorts that you get anyway. So now not only do you got your reels and your shorts and your TikToks, but you also get the long form with the podcast and you get the benefits of having cool guests, building relationships, you know, piggybacking off their audience. If they've got a big audience, you've got, you know, business deals that you guys might end up doing together because you have guests and it's just, it's a natural thing. You're just having a conversation, right? You don't need to like look at the camera and script and figure out all this crap. So long story short, um, our clients are having a ton of success podcasting now because it's just easier and better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you found the shortcut to success, right? Because you, you implemented what works for you and Hey, who's better to show you except the person that actually got success yeah. from what you're doing. Right? Exactly. And that's, that's what I did with a couple of my clients when I started my digital consulting as well. Yeah. You know, uh, I only worked with a limited amount, but they would basically, uh, outsource me for like three months. Okay. Get one, one time fee, but I would help them on a weekly basis. Okay. This is what you need to do. This is how you need to pivot. This is what you need to focus on as far as like IG and Facebook and all that jazz, how to frame it. Because at the end of the day, some of the best consultants out there, digital marketers, influencers, they're great storytellers. Yeah, they are straight up, man. Yeah. It's all about the story. A lot of people, they resonate with my brand and my companies, not because it's a cool logo, mm -hmm. but it's because who's backing it, you right. know, I'm backing it as a former first responder, nine to fiver who didn't know anything about this. Yeah. They didn't know anything about building organizations. And then on top of that, I coupled with the best in the game, man. Yeah. You know, 18 years of experience over nine figures. So at yeah. the end of the day, it's like a no brainer. Yeah. Like why wouldn't I want to team up with these guys? These guys yeah. are kicking ass and writing checks. Right. Yeah. So when I saw it, like your content, man, I remember there was one time you made a video and you were talking about like, yeah, I'm going the long route to build my social media platform by going on YouTube. Mm. I remember when you said this and then you said, I tried doing uh, paid traffic to, I think, Webinar Jam. Yeah. And I just didn't like the infrastructure. It wasn't me. You had to high pressure sales and all that jazz. And I'm like, dude, so many different ways yeah. for client acquisition and sales and digital marketing. Yeah. You know, I've, I've met a couple of consultants that would pay half a million dollars in ads and then have one big masterclass every single month. Yeah. But that would generate them about like one to 1.5 million yeah. in revenue it a month. And it works and it yeah. works for them. Right. But I'm like, that's too risky, dude. Like, well, and it's not long term. Yeah. It's not. It's almost like a, like a money grab. Yeah. Right, money grab, and then they would have to go into the next venture, which is why you see a lot of these guys they're, they're not building sustainable companies online. Yeah, that's just the reality of it, right? You know? So, when I looked at really the infrastructure behind my first company online, ATM Together, I was just like, I want sustainability, man. I want to be here for the long run. Yeah, so the way we did it is we essentially just provide value very heavily. How, how was I able to do that? The free Facebook group, I've created a free course, I created free ebooks, and then I do weekly lives. Like I actually go live and I interact with people. Like I'll bring guests and, yeah. and all that. We'll do raffles. We'll give away like entire ATM businesses. And that's not like on a weekly basis. I do that four times a week. Now mm. I, I delegated to my COO. So I'll do it bi-weekly. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, and it, and it works like a charm. You know why? Because they get to know us. Yeah. They get to know us. They get to go on informational calls with our staff. And then they're like, you know what? And how, how much of your revenue you think comes from the Facebook group? Facebook group at the time it was around 500 K 500 K. Um, because that's a month, that's a month. Yeah. And the reason why that's, it, that's pure profit. There's no ad spend to get that. 
So, so no, there, there was ad spend Okay, for the Facebook group. So you were doing ad spend to get people in the Facebook group. Correct. Okay. Got it. All right. So I'm about simplicity. Simplicity okay. equals success. Yep. I'm a big believer on that. Um, some of the biggest guys that I know, I always hear the same thing. Simple skills, right? Yep. So what I do is essentially we set up like a simple cl- like landing page, like a ClickFunnels landing page. And then basically we will summarize what we provide in the free Facebook group, the course, the guides, uh, the live trainings, Okay. provide value, provide social proof as well. And then people are able to opt in. We're able to get information. The companies that have the most information, the most data, emails, phone numbers, you're able to retarget them later on for other services or, or products or whatnot, right? right. Your email list. So then uh, as soon as they opt into the Facebook group, then we have an entire team. We have like appointment setters. Yep. We have a content management team. They post content for us on a weekly content schedule. So Monday through Sunday, uh, client testimonials, uh, past success stories, recent success stories, uh, motivational stories from my past because I am the founder, uh, motivational stories where I now tie into my team because majority of my employees who come work for me, I don't want them to stay static, man. I want them to grow. Yeah. So I asked them, like, whenever I interview anybody, I go, hey, what do you want out of this? Well, I want to do what you do. Yeah. What do you mean what I do? They're like, you know, uh, run a passive uh, income business. I'm like, dude, <laughs> dude, like it took years and it took like me working like more than I did as a cop to build this. Like, yeah. you're not going to get this immediately. Yeah. And as you've been saying, you're still working. I'm still working. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how you're doing it, bro. You know, <laughs> 20 to 30. I mean, yeah. I was just like, oh, that, that impressed me, man. 20 yeah. to 30 with seven companies. That's, that's where it's at. That's yeah. what everybody should strive for. Mm-hmm. Right. But um, yeah, so I get my people in there and now I basically make them digital marketers. Right. You know, I'm like, you're not just a consultant. You're not just an appointment setter. You're not just a VA. You're actually training to be a digital marketer because I want to show you exactly what I see every day. Yeah. I want to show my vision. I want to show how I frame things. I want yeah. to show how I story tell, how you should actually provide a customer service to clients mm-hmm. because that's what's missing nowadays, man. Yeah. No, it's 100%. the customer service aspect. Well, I'll add this too. So I want to talk about the digital marketing side and then, you know, the 20 to 30 hours. So, and I tell people this all the time, right? They're like, okay, but when you first started where you work in 60 hours, 80 hours and all this stuff. And I'm like the actual office, you know, things I would consider work. No, like I just never have, like I've never worked weekends or anything. I just figured out ways to do things more efficient than most people. I learned how to hire and delegate. And like, that was always my mindset, you know, and I started flipping houses I wasn't like, no, I'm g- I'm going to go fix up this house. And like, I'm like, no, I'm just going to hire this guy so I can go play baseball and do the things I want to do. Right. And so those habits kind of always have been there. Like even to this day, people think I'm a digital marketer, which I guess I am, but I've never run a Facebook ad. Like mm. I don't, I don't even know how to set it up. Yeah. Right. Now I know how to make an ad and I know like what will get traffic and I understand how funnels and landing page, like I understand it all. I've just never have created it. I've never logged into ClickFunnels. I don't know how it works. They're like, dude, it's so easy. And I'm like, that's great. You go do it then. Um, So that and, you know, the delegation is a huge part. But number two is, I would say though that I still outwork everyone, not everyone, but let's say 99% of the world just in the span of like work. So like to me, what is work? I mean, I'm going to work on my marriage. I'm going to work on my faith. I'm going to work on my body. Business just happens to be only one element of all the things I am working on. And so it's like, yeah, I'm only going to devote 30 hours a week in this office. I also am working on a whole bunch of other things in my life that are important to me. Like I'm not just sitting home watching Netflix, doing nothing. Like I work all day, every day, being a better dad, learning, reading books, you know, all those things. And you know, as a byproduct of having a lot of quote unquote free time, dude, I just get so many business ideas and things that like improve the businesses where I'm like, I just send a text off and I'm like, Hey, this is what we need to do. And it's just because I've, you know, if I was in the day to day, just only focusing on ads and like running them, I would never be able to innovate. Your creative basically mind just goes away, man, because you're just so stuck in the machine. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Yeah. So I just want to always have the freedom to be creative. So when I'm working out, yeah, I'm working out, but I'm also (laughs) thinking about problems in the business and the next move and this and that. And, 
you know, if I'm in prayer, I'm trying to like clear my mind, but like, I'm trying to hear from God on things I should be doing. You know, if I'm out of date night now, I do need to figure out how to just separate all of it and just be focused, you know, me and my wife, but that, you know, that one's a work in progress. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, priorities change too. Um, are you married? I'm not married. Just okay. Girlfriend. How old are you? I'm uh, 20, 35. Okay. So we're about the same age. I'm yeah. 34. So, you know, I've been, I'm going on my 10th year of marriage yeah. and you know, it's like, man, when I was 24, when I got married is like very different than 34. And now I have three kids and you're like priorities have changed dramatically in the last five years. And it's like the things, you, and also too, when you make more money, the things you used to value and you're like, all right, you know what? It's like, it's not that important. You oh know? man, you're, you're speaking to the choir, man. I, I still have buddies that will hit me up. Hey man, let's go out. Yeah. Bro, I can't like physically. Number one, I I'm can't. 35 now. Well, my <laughs> body has completely changed. Like, <laughs> like I ache if I have one drink and you know, I used to be into the whole party scene back when I was in my twenties. Yeah. And, you're a nightclub guy. Yeah. And if I was to tell my old self back then, dude, go away from this yeah. <laughs> focus on bu business, yeah. you know, start, start generating that cash flow because it'd be a lot easier. Cause I had more energy, Yeah, you know, but as you get older, man, you got to do, you know, the, the, the health options as well. You got to health is wealth, man. Yeah, and I've learned that the hard way. I gotta, I gotta drink my water every day. Yeah. I gotta I get some physical uh, exercise because a lot of the stress from work, it does build up. Oh yeah. So you need to release it for sure. You know, well, I always golf, baby. I gotta just like take it out on the ball, man. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've tried to be passionate about golf, just like my ex coworkers back in law enforcement. They used to take me out all the time. Yeah, dude. I don't know what it is. If if it's my ADD that just like stops me from just actually enjoying the game. Mm. But yeah, I don't. I don't know what it is. It's a. You know what I found is that the best entrepreneurs are both patient and impatient mm. and you know, they're impatient in that they want to keep moving and keep pushing forward. And like, they want results way quicker than everyone else, but they're also patient enough to play the long game yes. and be like, you know what? Like this is going to take a long time to hit the yeah. goal. And I'm okay with that. I don't, I'm not going to quit because it's going to take this many years. And that was like kind of to the story you brought up that I said many years ago yeah. about the webinars. And I was like, you know what? I know I'm going to do webinars at some point, yeah. but today I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm, it's not worth it. I, I don't need the money. I'm just going to focus on the long-term vision of building the brand and everything else. And then once the brand's built, then I'll worry about it, you know, and now webinars, eh, I don't know. We do them maybe every other month or something, but yeah, nothing now you, crazy. Now you can reap the rewards because you've built such a following that people resonate with you and they like you, they see the value. And now whenever you do have webinars, instead of worrying about, well, what you are know, my metrics? Yeah. What are my metrics? Yeah. You know, how much are we spending? How yeah. much is this? You know, it's going to come. Yeah. You know, it's going to come. Exactly. So, um, no, man, I mean, I, I respect it and I, I love it. You know, I'm on myself, me, me and John, we were talking about, I was just like, dude, I got to start doing YouTube. I like, I got to start doing YouTube, but then oh, we'll comes do your podcast for you. Pineda media. We got you, dude. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. got you. I'll sell you. Um, like, yeah. So ever since we, like we partnered with, with Paul, like I'm, I'm literally doing, I'm probably doing about 30, zooms a week now 30 zooms a week what do you do yeah <laughs> i don't do 30 zooms in a year sales <laughs> development yeah sales development i'm training a lot all these all oh the, all the students you're teaching them the how students. to sell these these owners a absolutely but now yeah. now we're doing you know one hour trainings yeah you know and then i was telling him we're gonna go into doing two three hour trainings that way it'll minimize some of the zooms but yeah. you'll have more do time. one big training a week or something absolutely that's it yep. yeah but, but yeah, it's like, you know, now I'm getting used to being on the camera, in front of the camera, talking to, them, to yeah. the agents every day as well. Yeah. We have probably across all the businesses or coaching programs, I should say, we have probably about 15 Zooms a week at least. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm only like on one or two. So it's good because like, dude. If, I, if you told me I had to be on 30 Zooms a week, oh my gosh, dude, I would not be in the, 
the that, coaching business. That's what I'm talking about, Ryan, because I mean, I, I, I flat out tell, tell you guys on, on, on your podcast that I used to take all my sales calls in the beginning, man. Yeah. Like I was a one man team my third month when I launched the ATM together. Collect- but there's nothing wrong with that there, there, when you're starting out. There, there isn't. But then also I felt like I had to learn it, man. Yeah. Because I didn't have the mindset of delegation. I didn't have the mindset of like, how do I build a team? I was just like, I could do this on my own. Yeah. And I think I brought like almost like the toxic mindset of law enforcement oh. where like, I could do this. I'm prideful, you know, yeah. like I could do everything uh, by you, myself. You weren't taking in the mindset of like. Longevity, basically. Yeah. I because like when you're starting out and you can't hire people and whatever, you can't afford it. It's like, all right, yeah, you do need to sell everything and you got to generate your leads. You got to be the guy. Um, but the moment you can bring on somebody, exactly, most people are like, oh, why am I going to pay that guy? I'll just do it. And it's like, no, that guy's an asset. Yeah. No, it's, it's a big asset, especially yeah. if you're able to delegate majority of like your operations and you're able to buy back your time essentially. Yeah. Right. So eventually I learned, man. Eventually I oh, learned. Yeah, dude, you got 50 employees you guys have done. You said 18 million over. In one, yeah, this one with Merchant to go back to, you know, something that you've built, man, um, as far as like your following. The following that I had from my first digital marketing company with ATM together, when I basically launched the beta program for Merchant Services for the new company that I yeah. launched in February, I was able to uh, do the startup as a one-man team, just yep. went back to my old school traits. <laughs> I mean, it's what I know, man. Yeah, yeah. So I went there and uh, we were actually able to collect in revenue a million dollars in five weeks. Wow. And it's just because of the following, the good business, and then also just recurring You had the past clients. customers who wanted this new thing. As soon as I was like, I'm, yeah. so, I'm, I'm I started a credit card company and they're, yeah. they're like, whoa. Yeah. They're like, we want in on that. Yeah. Because they're, we did have a huge amount of prospects that were scared to go and load traditional ATMs with cash. That makes and sense. And I understand that. Yeah, that I mean, sense. I was previous, you know, a law enforcement officer, so I was able to carry a gun and all that jazz, but not everybody can, right? Or they choose not to. Because <laughs> well, I don't know about California, but yeah, <laughs> I, got, I got my concealed carry here. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I moved to Florida, you know, they recently just passed that law where everyone could carry, man. It's just oh, really? Like, you don't even need a permit. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't know that. That's Florida's, wild. dude, Florida's cool, man. They just do whatever. I, I, I love Florida, man. Like I moved there like three weeks. It's, it's paradise, dude. What like, city? Uh, Miami. Okay. Yeah, Miami. But I'm more of the outskirts. I'm in South Miami. I was so gonna I'm, say, didn't you say you're not partying anymore? I'm not. But I'm you're not. in Miami. Yeah. So what do you do? So, <laughs> hey man, my house literally is in. You could talk like farmland. Okay. Like literally brand new build. Uh, has has the works, but at the end of the day, it's just peace. Yeah. It's just peace. It's 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 nice. It's quiet. And then um, we're establishing actual brick and mortar offices down there too. That's going to be in downtown Miami, but it's more to have just the employees fly in once a month, see the face to face and yeah. then boom, go do their thing. Keep so motivating them. Your whole, co- your whole um, company's virtual? Yeah. So we had a virtual. Uh, when I initially left law enforcement, I had one really good friend. I had one really good friend that basically loved talking about business with me. Okay. And uh, he was, he just got promoted to sergeant of police during that time. Really young guy too. He's he, at the time, I think he was like 27. Yeah. And just got promoted youngest uh, police sergeant in that department. And uh, when I told him I was leaving, he was just like, all right, man, well, if you have a job for me, let me know. Mm. And, and he was kidding. Yeah. But I took that to heart. I was like, all right. Yeah. So four months later, when I started, okay, I need to hire like a COO. I need to hire yeah. somebody for operations. Hey man, I could pay you like triple what you're getting paid <laughs> right now and you don't got to work all that overtime. Yeah. And it's a little bit safer, right? He's just like, deal. I'm he in. moved to San Diego. I ended up moving to San Diego for two years. Okay. Uh, when I left law enforcement back in early 2021. And I moved to San Diego for just a different environment, man. Because I felt like just living in the Bay Area at that time, I was still around the same mindset yeah, of you just comfort, grow. dude. Yeah. You know, so I wanted something different. I wanted got to it. get inspired every day. Yeah. So I went to San Diego, got got a nice uh, apartment, you know, with uh, ocean view. And when I would wake up, I'd just be motivated to work. Yeah. And that's when the business grew, you know, the first year to 1.7. Second year, we were doing like a million a month. Right now, on average, we're doing about a million to 1.5, but that's ATM together. Yeah. With Merchant, that was launched in February, and a million dollars in five weeks. 
and we have to refine our offers just like everything else, yep. the call centers. And we figured out that it wasn't as easy to close people on the phone like it was with ATMs. Because when you think about it with merchants, they see ATMs as an ancillary service. So it's like free money for them. But with merchant services, you're running all of the revenue through the credit card machines, man. So they're not going to trust you immediately. They're yeah, going to be yeah. like, are you trying to scam me, bro? Yeah. Yeah. Your sales cycle is very different. So we had to transform a lot of that. And that's the key aspect that John came in with PayBot and all that. And, you know, we, we set up the right type of infrastructure for this business where we basically are, yes, we're helping you with a business in a box, but it's not like it's fully automated. No, yeah. it's where you're actually, I'm letting you borrow my team. Yeah. The team that I spent literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to refine, to make sure that the process works. Yeah. I meet me, me myself. I even went out to merchants and was closing deals yeah. because it's proven concept. You have to, if you're going to sell it yourself, especially online, dude, you need social proof. Yeah. I'm not just going to go out there and be like, yeah, guys use this machine. Well, how many do you have? I'm be like, none. <laughs> but like, no, that doesn't work like that, man. Yeah. But you see a lot of course creators, influencers, all that jazz doing that all day online, man. Yeah. They're like, dude, what type of experience do you have? You yeah, know? So it just comes, comes down to it, man. Just good business. I'm yeah. a big believer in, providing value, good business, transparency. And at the end of the day, um, a lot of my clientele does come from being first responder. Uh, I get a lot of people in the medical field. My two sisters are registered yep. nurses, so I could relate to a lot of that. Yep. Never went into nursing myself because I was always afraid of needles. Yep. But um, no, man, that, that's it. Digital marketing basically changed my life, no. to be honest. I love it, dude. I love hearing the story too, man. It's just incredible journey of cop to side hustles to then turning that into you know, this full, full on community. And now you're partnering up with a guy who's done nine figures. Like, dude, it's amazing, man. Yeah. Are, where's, where's your office? Our office is in Los Angeles. Okay. We're, we're right by Universal Studios. So you guys have, um, it, would you say most is virtual or all in office? How's that no, work? We, it's funny because, you know, during the pandemic, we were like, hey, everybody can go work from home. And nobody did. Really? So we did not close the whole time. And our staff was just, we we're, were surprised. Like I was staying home, you know, I was working from home. Yeah. My partner was as well. And we were like, but they were showing up every day and we're like, oh, wow, that's weird. Like, you know, most people would want to go work from home. Yeah. But no, they just decided. They like they, it. Yeah. They liked. How many employees there. do you have? We, pro we have about 15 employees in-house and we have about 300 sales reps nationwide. Got it. And they're yeah. just beaten doors. Yep. You know, you know, just going out there, there's different ways of doing it. Some have their own websites. Yeah. Some have, you know, they have connections with the chamber of commerce. Uh, they partnered with other people that's, you know, like, uh, kinda, wine distributors. I mean, it, it really reminds me of just like the insurance industry, the solar industry. It's like kind of the same model. Yeah. Yep. It's just, you know, getting out there and, you know, talking to people. It's like I was telling them, I was in line at the hotel. At, I'm staying at the Vidara and I was there and I'm in line and there's this uh, young guy there. And he's just talking and he just says, hey, how's it going? And I'm like, oh, yeah, good, good. And he's like, yeah, I own a business here. And, and I said, oh, I do the merchant services. He's like, oh, yeah, I, I take credit cards at my business. You know, gave me his card right there. Just like that. I'm, I can sign a deal. Anyone who has a business is your customer. Yeah, absolutely. Like that's, that's the crazy part. Yep. Right. Walk, driving down the street, any business is a potential customer. Yep. Yeah, I love it. It's really a no brainer because no one's promoting it heavy on digital in like the digital space right now. No, no, no one, man. I try, I do my due diligence before I start up anything. Yeah. And I go and I did my market. Who research. are my competitors? Who are my competitors? Let's see who's going to like top our program. What are they providing? None. Yeah. Right now, uh, and you could say possibly because there's a lot of baby boomers out there that have been in merchant services for so long, they're sticking to the old ways. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, what is it? Flyers, um, mailing, uh, what is it? A door to door. Yeah, door to door, but mailing, mailing flyers to promote their business. Yeah. You know, all this old school methods, which, yes, it will still work, but it's not going to move the needle like running ads. Yeah. It's not going to move the needle like actually promoting yourself and actually building a relationship or a foundation with your clients. Yeah. You know, and that's why I love social media, man. I mean, well, we're able to go on the live right now, probably, probably have a couple hundred people just watching us, and we'll just do QA. Yeah. And you'll actually get sales from that. Yeah. You know, because people will resonate you. 
they'll be like, man, I really like what Ryan said. Oh, really like what Paul said or John said. Yeah. Dude, that's kick ass. Oh, and that's going to be the day, man, that yeah. they're finally like, all right. I'm, I'm doing gonna, it. I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm yeah. going to do it now. Yeah. You know? And that's, that's what it is. I've had clients that been following me for like a year and a half. And they're like, dude, I've been wanting to do this since the beginning, but I had to do my due diligence. I was like, damn dude, a year and a half is due mm -hmm. diligence for no, sure. Yeah. No, that happens all the time with me, man. Cause we hold a lot of events, you know, we got wealth con and we've got, you know, workshops. You saw the workshop room and, yeah. um, I'll always ask the audience and I'll be like, for whatever it is we're talking about, right? And I'll be like, so how many, how long have you guys been following me? And then there'll be people like saying years, years. And I'll be like, okay, you know, how many is this the first time, you know, you're, you know, buying something from me, right? right. And, you know, there'll be a bunch of hands and I'm like, wow, you know, it took years of nurturing to, you know, finally get them in a room. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, and, and it's amazing. Yeah. When you think about it, it's amazing yeah. because it's a snowball effect, man. Even if you do a piece of content, which you think it's not going to move the needle, maybe you get like, I don't know, like a couple of likes on it, a couple of comments yeah. and it doesn't go viral. Yeah. Right. Well, you know what I love about like, for me anyways, is that with most influencers or content creators, you know, let's say you're Mr. Beast. It's like, you're never going to really meet Mr. Beast. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just, he's going to be doing his thing. Yeah. You know, you're not going to meet Joe Rogan or any of these guys, but like, dude, I throw events every month. It's like, you can find me, you know? And so it's, it's, uh, it's cool being able to like truly interact with the people who, um, resonate with you. Yeah. And then like, you know, the events attract very like-minded people. And so mm -hmm. that's why we just keep throwing more events. I'm like, dude, I love it. It's actually a smart move, man. When I was talking to Jonathan, he, uh, he had mentioned that you went to the Grand Cardone's, I guess, offices and you saw his setup and yeah. the way the stage was. Well, as soon as I entered, Last month, I went to Scottsdale, Arizona, where Andy Elliott's at. Yep. And I went to one of his sales web, um, you know, live webinars or, or whatnot, not webinars, but, you know, live uh, events. And I took my entire sales team. Okay. And when we went in there, man, they're all wearing his logo. They're chanting. Yeah. They're like, congratulations. <laughs> welcome. They're pumped. They're like, who wants a Celsius? <laughs> and I was just like, yeah. I was just like, dude, it made me see America. You know, like, I was oh, just like, dude. this is pump dude like bro the andy, atmosphere. andy kills me man dude yeah, he's, been guy, here, yeah. he's been here at least three four five times and uh we actually have a new episode coming out with him here soon but dude andy's one of my favorite people because he is just he brings his team they're freaking hyped every time you see him the other day he was bringing his new freaking personal trainer He's like, Ryan, oh, dude, yeah. we got to get you going, man. We'll get you and shredded in three months. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So, dude, it's <laughs> so awesome. funny. I love them. Um, but yeah, they're, look, I mean, building sales teams is, as you know, it's a, it's a hard thing to do. It is. And so um, guys like Andy, I've had guys like Jeremy Miner, um, you know, Grant, you know, a bunch of sales trainers on. And so the more that I see their environments and what they've built, the more I realize I'm like, yep. I mean, you want to build a big, big boy sales team? You need some people who are hungry, who have energy, who are hunting, you know. Morale, culture yeah. was the two biggest needle movers when I built my sales team. And these guys, they have been with me since the beginning, man. Like for ATM together, I was able to build it up to seven consultants that just go talk to clients yeah. just directly. That's not including everyone else. But then out of those seven, I took the top two and I brought them over to merchant services. Yeah. I was just like, hey, man, you guys want to deal with a new offer. Heck yeah, let's go do it. Boom. Yeah. They helped me build the infrastructure. And then same thing with the third company, the digital consulting that I'm doing, right? Yeah. I just take one of them, take the best guy that wants to do that type of niche. Right. Yep. But um, what I learned is also leading by example, man, you know, they follow the leader. So yeah. if you're like in there, like, this is where we're going, I'm going to take you to the promised land. <laughs> and all of them, they're like, ah, Let's go. Yeah, it's morale. And it goes back to like my roots in law enforcement because, you know, I was in a department. It was a very good department for what they were able to do. Right. Even though they had like <laughs> everything against them, um, morale was low, man. Yeah. Morale was low. Officers were low. So when <gasps> I saw what made, what made the best officers in the department motivated every day to work. And it's because they surround themselves with winners. 100%. So all the top tier guys that were like what you would call high speed in yeah. law enforcement, yeah. they would kick it with other high speed guys that yeah. were about it. They were amped. They were like, 
how many drug dealers are you going to arrest today? Oh, exactly. dude, I got like five today. They're like, oh, I you was, know? I was literally, so we had our company wide meeting yesterday and I was on stage talking to him. I was like, look, this is what I'm looking for. I want people who want to win. Yeah. Okay. It's not about the money. It's not about like, I just want you to compete and win at whatever you're competing at. Yeah. Okay. I want you to get, if it's, if it's sales, go get the most deals today. Okay. If it's coaching, go crush the coaching call yes. and make it the best call you've ever seen. If it's marketing, go get your cost per lead down so far that it's the best you've ever seen, right? Like yeah. all of these things just make it the very best. You, you're doing this podcast editor. Okay. Edit it to the very best that it can be. It's like, I want to create this culture of being the best and just winning at whatever it is, not for any monetary gain, but just for the fact of being the best and taking yeah. pride in what you do and the money will come straight up, dude. Yeah. I mean, I've always, you know, I've always been the best at everything. With any company that I've worked for, I mean, I was the best dishwasher. Yep. Um, and I was, I was always, you know, so good at be, even being the best dishwasher that, you know, I could, I would get my work done so fast Then I would go to the kitchen and, and tell the chef, what do you want to, what do you want me to help you with? Yeah, you know exactly. what I'm saying. So what I was doing is I was creating my value. Uh, I would be, I became so valuable to the restaurant because I was able to offer that value. Exactly. You know where other people are just they go in and they're just like, okay, my job is to do this. This is all I'm going to do. Yep. You know, and that's they're kind of stuck there, wondering why they don't get a raise. Why don't you know? You know why aren't they they're moving up? Where me, even when I started merchant services, I worked for another company first for three years. I would go into the owner and I would say, hey, I want to make a bonus this month. Yeah. How they, can I do it? Yeah. What, how many deals do you need me to bring in? Exactly. exactly. And and he would be like, bring in this. Boom. I'd crush it. Yeah. You know? Next month, I'd come back. Hey, boom. That so, was easy. What next? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Exactly. So, and everybody else, people that had been working for the company longer than me, they were like, you know, and then I, I would be uh, by the water cooler or the copy machine t training everybody else about, you know, my sales and how to do sales and this is that. Yeah. And the next thing you know, they're like, damn, are you the manager? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm the dishwasher. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I'm like, yeah, pretty much. I guess I, I am. Volumes. You know, because, yeah, you yeah. know, because I'm, I'm doing things that a manager yeah. would do without even being the manager. So I'm, 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 yeah. I'm automatically in that position. hundred percent. And that's literally what I told him too. I go, you know, I was given this example of one of our guys and I was like, look, he came to me asking me to mentor him, yeah. you know, and I was like, no, I'm not because you haven't shown that you deserve to be mentored. Exactly. And I was like, you're what I would call. And this was just straight up honest. I go, you're what I would call like a C B level employee, maybe B. I go, you're great. Your culture fit. You're fine, but you don't go above and beyond. You know, you don't do anything that you just do what you're told and like, that's it. I mean, let's, let's keep it real, man. It's called the employee's mentality they're not looking at the long game as far as trying to go and be more than yeah. what they're actually doing, but they want the instant gratification. Whenever I talk to my guys, I'm like, Hey, do you see that you're going to work here for the rest of your life? Or what do you want out of this? Yeah. And that's even with the new hires and yeah. they'll say, well, I want to get to the point where, you know, I got residuals coming in. I got multiple businesses. I want to be where you're at. I want to be, uh, I mean, bigger than where, where you're at. And I'm like, that's cool. How are you going to get there? Well, uh, I want you to mentor me. I want you to do this. I was like, well, number one, I don't have all the time in the world to mentor you. But if you show me that you're going to be the best type of employee that I have, then I can guarantee you, you're going to be the first one to have some of the best opportunities in my organization. Exactly. And that's how it happens. Yep. You know, my, my buddy that was Sergeant of Police, he didn't start a CAO. Yeah. He started as an appointment setter. Exactly. But he crushed it yeah. the first three months because to him, he was just like, dude, this is way easier than, uh, than <laughs> being a Sergeant of Police. Yeah. Busting drug, <laughs> busting gangs and all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> he was just like messaging yeah. people, having conversations. Just he's yep. on the phone like, no, no, no. Like just literally just closing deals left to right. I was like, okay, cool. You're a consultant now. Became a consultant three months later. I was just like, all right, I need like a really operations guy because I need to start delegating. I want to make the program better. I want to make the company better. I want to expand. I want to start doing this and that. And he was just like, all right, I'm up for it, man. Yeah. He's just like, so how do I do it? I was like, figure it out. 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> That's how it is, man. I mean, yep. like imperfect action. You yep. have to take it. Imperfect action is all that matters. Absolutely. But, yeah. You know, the cool thing though, with the story of my employee was this was, you know, three months ago and I go, and I actually drilled him way harder than what I just shared. So there was even more. And I go, do these things and then talk to me. Mm-hmm. And then you'll prove to me that like, you're actually about this. Yeah. And then sure enough, you know, he's been making a lot of changes. One was his weight. Mm-hmm. I go, you don't even take your health seriously. Like I'm not here to babysit you. Yeah. You're 20 something years old and you can't even take care of your health. Yeah. And you know, he's lost like 30 pounds in three months. And so, you know, look, people need a reality check. And that's the reality of life. And if people think, if, if, if somebody doesn't know why their life is the way it is or mm-hmm. why they're not getting that promotion, you know, that's on us as the boss for yeah. like being too scared to tell them the truth, yeah. right? Because a guy like him, I could have been like, oh, you know, I don't really have the time. And like, I could have left it at that and not tried to like, not that I was trying to hurt his feelings, but like, be like, well, you know, you're a good guy. But when an opportunity comes, that's what most people do. They'd lie. Yeah. They'd be like, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. But by being brutally honest. You have to be, man. Yeah. It was like, well, these are the things. This is why I won't do it. Yeah. And until you can fix these things, and even once you fix them, you then got to maintain them. Exactly. Right? Then let's have a, a conversation. And then, you know, it's like, all right, well, he is now very aware. And, and in a sense, I was mentoring him. You know, I'm like- <laughs> No, you are. This is what you have to do. Exactly. This is your first lesson. It's 10 minutes. Don't talk to me for six more months until you do it. Yeah. Because it's not going to happen overnight. No. And and that's reality. It's the hard truth when it comes to entrepreneurship, because unless you have someone guiding you, actually giving you a step-by-step play on exactly what to do, number one, you're not going to know everything. Yeah. So whenever I get anyone new, whether it's in my sales organization or they want to do customer service or they just flat out want to work for me. I'm going to see how much due diligence you did on research on me yeah. and the company. Yeah. Because I've had people that ask me for $180,000 for a sales position in my organization, but they can't even tell me what we do. <laughs> and that's embarrassing. That's super embarrassing. No, but I'm like, how don't you know what we do? You know, I was actually talking to Andy Elliott about that. So I was asking him, I said, Hey dude, how should I recruit salespeople <laughs> and, you know, vet them better? Right. Yeah. Because how do you vet how good they really are? And he was like, well, Okay. He was selling me on his sales program. He goes, Hey, <laughs> you know, you go give him my sales program, right? And you'd get whatever access. And you say, Hey, here's the six videos I want you to watch before our meeting, right? You get on the interview with them. And, you know, all of a sudden you say, Hey, so did you watch those six videos? Yeah. Yeah. You look in the back, you can see what they watched. Doesn't show you watched them here. Yeah. Right. That's already like the first red flag of they're lazy, they're not serious about it. No, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I have uh, bought sales courses from uh, Ryan Stuman. Uh-huh. Ryan Stuman, I mean, his energy is great. You know, I used to listen to him all the time when I was in law enforcement, but I would buy his sales courses and they're probably like 500 bucks, but then I give it to my guys. Yeah. Hey guys, special surprise. Spend the weekend. Look at this. We're going to have a meeting on Monday. Yeah. I want you to tell me exactly what you learned from, and I can tell who actually reviewed the lessons and who didn't. I mean, you could see on the back end. A hundred percent. But then when you're actually drilling them right there on a hot seat. Yeah, they, they don't know. They yeah. don't know. And they're like, oh, well, uh, I forgot that. Bullshit. You didn't watch You it. didn't forget. You're just, you're comfortable where you're at. And guess yeah. what? Being comfortable, what you're doing right now is not going to get you to what you want. Yeah. And that's the reality for most people in general, man. Yeah. They won't get uncomfortable to get comfortable. Yeah. I mean, that's what I had to do. I, I went from being a cop to literally working behind the computer, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's yeah, just you like gotta, night You got to get uncomfortable. And that, that was part of my message yesterday too, was guys, look, y'all are very talented or else you wouldn't be here. Okay. You have a choice. You can be content being a talented person, but guess what? I'm going to bring in more talented people. Mm-hmm. And so the cream rises to the top. We're, com- we're here to compete. I'm not exactly. here to accept the way you are today. And that's good for the rest of your life. So. Yeah. You can't stay static, man. No. You got to level up. I you mean, you're, level up. You're, you're leveling up every, every well, year, year, dude. And that's so, what I, I mean, told him. I go, look, and I'm going to set the tone for you guys mm-hmm. on how to level up. Cause I could be content, but I'm never going to be content. Right. I'm going to level up everywhere and show you guys firsthand that if you think you're content, no, that ain't going to work. Yeah. So. No, absolutely, man. But, but dude, I appreciate having you both on. I learned a ton about 
just all these businesses with payment processing and everything, man. And it's super cool what you guys are seeing. Um, for those who are interested in learning more about all these different things, where can they go? Yeah, they can check me out. I actually have two Instagrams, man, Paul Alex, and then the Paul Alex. And then um, if you want to know what we're doing regarding merchant services, you could go to merchantautomation.com. Cool. Awesome, guys. We'll go check it out and make sure you subscribe to the channel and we'll see you on the next one. Peace. A lot of business owners, when they get confronted with things that create stress, resistance, anxiety, fear, it pushes them to indecision and it's the indecision that kills them. And so I tell business owners, you know, you need to look for those moments where you're like, this is a do or die moment. Yeah. And then take action. This